We start this morning. Uh, our first item of business will be general questions. I just remind members that um, if, answer, if questions and answers can be as brief as possible, we'll get through more questions. And we start with number one, Colin Beattie. Ask the Scottish Government what support it provides to local communities where nearby rivers have been polluted by waste overflows from detritus flushed down toilets. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. Scottish Water carry out regular proactive inspections in areas that have had previous pollution incidents and whenever pollution is found, cleanups take place. Further to this, Scottish Water will be working closely with communities to help educate customers about what should and should not be flushed down the toilet. Colin Beattie. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. She may be aware that this issue has occurred recently at the Maryburn in my constituency. Can she outline what support the Scottish Government will provide to SEPA Scottish Water in my constituents to ensure this issue will not reoccur? Uh, I am aware of the uh, situation uh, with the Mary Barn. I know uh, that on a number of occasions Scottish Water has attended to clean up the immediate debris. There's also a commitment uh, to spend a prolonged period doing a much wider clean up where there has been a more significant impact and that is nearing completion. In addition to undertaking cleaning, Scottish Water has also completed some adjustments to the network, including constructing a higher weir plate at the storm screen to prevent the overflow triggering when it should not. The Scottish Government will provide £210 million to support Scottish Water's £3.6 billion capital investment programme in 2018-19, and we do make sure that uh, SEPA is adequately funded to uh, perform its regulatory role to protect our environment. And officials do stand ready uh, to provide any additional support that may be required. However, I need to reiterate that people do need to stop putting the wrong things down the toilet in the first place. Stuart McMillan. Thanks, Spending Officer. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, I've recently been contacted by a constituent to inform me of the issue of uh, caravan and mobile home users actually dumping the contents of their chemical toilets by, this, by roadsides instead of actually paying to dispose of this waste in the designated areas. Uh, can the Cabinet Secretary uh, join me in condemning this behaviour, but also um, it could provide uh, some response to uh, which agency or agencies should actually be dealt with actually tackling this issue, but also could uh, some type of public information campaign actually be launched in this? Uh, this is disgusting behaviour. Um, I'm sure everybody in the Chamber uh, will feel the same about it, so I do share the member's concern. Uh, it is the responsibility of everyone living or visiting Scotland to dispose of their waste in the appropriate manner at designated facilities. Any evidence of this type of behaviour should be reported directly to the Scottish Environment Protection Agency. Question number two, Gillian Martin. Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what work it's undertaken to make misogyny a crime. Minister Christina McKelvey. <laughs> very much, President Officer. We will shortly be launching a public consultation in response to recommendations made by Lord Brackadale on hate crime legislation in Scotland. This will consider how criminal law might be strengthened to tackle misogynistic behaviour, including whether crimes motivated by hostility based on gender should be a hate crime. We are committed to taking action to tackle gender-based prejudice and misogyny in Scotland, and we are open to, to any views on what action we should be taking that's most effective. Gillian Martin. Thank the Minister for that answer. A crime motivated by hatred of women could take many forms. There have been debate already around what kind of evidence would have to be required for misogyny to be proven as a motivator. Can the Minister give an indication of the work being done to ensure that a definition around misogynistic hate crime is workable and provides a sound basis for something that could be argued in court by a prosecutor and could make clear a clear and functional distinction between misogynist, misogynistic hate crime and any other crime? Minister. Thank you, President Officer. Um, there is a clear need, as we know, to be taking action to tackle gender-based prejudice and misogyny in Scotland, and we are keeping a very open mind on the best way to address these types of behaviours. We have committed to consult on how the criminal law might be strengthened as part of efforts to tackle misogynistic behaviour, and we will launch the consultation next month. This will seek views on a range of options, including new criminal law measures. I would encourage any interested party to share their views through the consultation exercise, because that will inform the best way forward in tackling misogynistic behaviour and Put the law into legislation. Question number three, John McCarthy. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on legally obliging landowners to formally engage with communities affected by major changes in land use. 
Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. The Scottish Government's guidance on engaging communities in decisions relating to land sets expectations that all landowners across urban and rural Scotland will engage with their local communities about decisions relating to land that will have a significant impact on the local community. Jo McAlpine. Uh, thank you. Uh, does the Scottish Government share my concern uh, over the Duke of Buccleuch uh, advertising coal bed methane deposits at Cannonby in its uh, sale of the Evertown estate, despite the local community's continued objections to any extraction proposals? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the Scottish Government uh, does not support unconventional oil and gas development in Scotland, and that does include coal bed methane. Uh, no local authority can grant planning permission for any proposed fracking or coal bed methane project and Scottish ministers would defer any decision on any planning application that did come forward until the full policy making pro process on our preferred position is completed. And the pr practical effect of that is that there is no fracking or other unconventional oil or gas activity can take place in Scotland at this time. Um, in line with statutory requirements earlier this week, we published for consultation the Strategic Environmental Assessment Environmental Report on our preferred policy position. And that consultation is the next step, continues the dialogue with the public on this important issue, will run for eight weeks from the 23rd of October. It is anticipated that ministers will inform Parliament of their finalised policy on unconventional oil and gas in Scotland in the first quarter of 2019. And that is the backdrop uh, that uh, uh, people will uh, be operating in uh, regardless of who they are. I'm sure the member knows that that is, uh, strictly speaking, a policy for another portfolio. Thank you. Question number four, Stuart Stevenson. To ask the Scottish Government whether it is discussed with the UK Government raising the UK's proposed 10 megabit universal service obligation for broadband to match Scotland's plans for universal availability of at least 30 megabits. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, the Scottish Government has repeatedly urged the UK Government to match Scotland's ambition and set the broadband universal service obligation at 30 megabits per second. This would, of course, help deliver the super-fast broadband connections that our rural communities need. Scotland is the only part of the UK to have committed to extending super-fast access to 100% of premises, supported by an initial procurement of £600 million. Despite numerous requests and despite the regulation and legislation of telecoms being wholly reserved to the UK Parliament, the UK Government has contributed a mere 3.5% of this investment, with the Scottish Government committing 96.5%. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you for that uh, illuminating answer. Can the Cabinet Secretary inform us whether the UK Government has given any assurances that the imposition of a 10 megabit universal service obligation on telecoms providers will not impede the Scottish Government's programme to deliver 30 plus megabits everywhere by 2021? Minister. Uh, the UK Government has not given any assurances. They have now formally handed over the implementation of the broadband USO uh, to Ofcom, though. Uh, Ofcom is due to consult on the designated USO provider uh, in the autumn. And the Scottish Government has a very positive working relationship with Ofcom. And officials are working closely to achieve alignment between the two schemes to help minimise confusion for the public, as well as ensuring most effective use of public funds. It would, however, be helpful if the UK Government would actually engage with us on this issue. Finlay Carson. This SNP government likes to talk up the record on broadband, but the reality for people and businesses in rural constituencies like Galloway and Western Fries is poor or no speeds. They don't care about speed obligations, they just want to know when they're going to get connected. Can the Minister give my constituents a commitment to publish a clear timescale for R100 to reach 100% by the summer of 2019? Minister. Uh, I think Mr Carson would be uh, well placed in actually reflecting the fact that it's the UK government's responsibility legally and regulatory yeah. responsibility yeah. Yeah. to ensure the delivery of broadband. This, the Scottish government is intervening using economic development powers to fix the mess that has been left by the UK government. Yeah, yeah. Now, in respect of his point about Dumfries and Galloway, we clearly have an shared interest in this. I should declare that, obviously, uh, presiding officer, as a member representing the south of Scotland, in ensuring constituents in Dumfries and Galloway, and I take that point seriously. Our 100% commitment is a huge statement of our ambition for Scotland's digital future. As I say, one unmatched elsewhere in the UK. The £600 million uh, being invested through the procurement contract, uh, we are on track to award contracts in 2019. I would hope 
in the second half of 2019. Only at that point do we know when the bidders have submitted their bids exactly which postcodes they will cover. And I, I would give an assurance to the member that we, will, as soon as we can communicate that information to his constituents and others, we will do so. Tavis Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, in the design of the procurement exercise that the Minister has just described, can he ensure that those areas uh, most in need, such as the Outer Isles and the Northern Isles of Shetland, are first in the queue to achieve the fibre to the home and premises and to businesses that is so badly needed? Minister. I, I certainly recognise the interest, not just in my capacity as co connectivity minister, but obviously with Ireland's responsibilities. These are key issues uh, for Ireland communities and take those very seriously. In terms of the procurement contract, we are taking an outside-in approach. So we're trying to focus on remote, rural and island communities first. So uh, without being, I don't want to overcommit in terms of Mr uh, Scott's constituency, but I would uh, be keen to, to explore with him and others who have this interest as soon as we have the information from the tenders about how we can give guarantees to uh, communities at how early the delivery will be. I would reiterate the point though, in the absence of the DSSB programme, we would be in a situation now with zero coverage of superfast broadband in the islands, and so we have achieved a lot to date. Question number five, Ian Gray. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to ensure equality of opportunity for young people across all local authorities. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. President Officer, our focus on raising attainment and achievement for all and ensuring that every child has the same opportunity to succeed has resulted in positive progress towards closing the poverty-related attainment gap. The Scottish Government supports local authorities to work collaboratively with national agencies, including Skills Development Scotland, to ensure that all young people receive the support that is most appropriate for them to fulfil their potential. Ian Gray. Presiding Officer, data from Skills Development Scotland for 2016-17 shows that while 62% of school leavers in East Dumbartonshire and East Renfrewshire went on to higher education after leaving school, only 26% of school leavers from Clackmannanshire did the same showing no improvement since 2010-11. That is a dramatic difference and does not look like progress. What action will be taken to end this postcode lottery in higher education? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think when we look at the position uh, across the country, the information that's uh, demonstrated by the UCAS figures shows a 3% increase in the number of placed applicants from deprived areas which is a record high and for the third year in a row. So um, the data demonstrates that on the question of widening access to higher education, um, the government is making progress on its objectives that it has set out to Parliament. We should also bear in mind, and this is an important consideration in the question of fulfilling the commitment to opportunities for all young people across Scotland, is that there are a range of positive destinations that can be pursued by young people including through modern apprenticeships, further education opportunities and higher education opportunities. And the most recent positive destination statistics across the whole country demonstrate the, the, the improvements in performance that have been delivered as a result of this commitment. Question number six, Alison Harris. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to reported warnings from nursery providers that its planned expansion of the childcare to 1140 hours by 2020 is about to implode. Minister Marie Todd. Providers in the private and third sector, including childminders, are absolutely vital to the expansion of early learning and childcare. We're supporting all providers in the transition to 2020, when parents will have greater flexibility to access their child's entitlement from high quality partner settings. We introduced 100% rate relief for day nurseries in April, established the ELC Partnership Forum, and we are significantly increasing funding for providers to deliver our living wage commitment. Alison Harris. Thank you for that response. However, unless the government steps in and sorts this out very quickly, then the whole project of 1140 hours is going to collapse. Those are not my words, those are the words of the childcare providers. Even fellow colleagues of the Minister and the SNP have raised concerns from childcare providers in their constituencies. Will the Minister agree to urgently investigate these concerns before it's too late for nurseries, children and parents? Minister Marita. So let me take the opportunity to reiterate once again just how crucial partner providers will be to the success of this expansion. We are working hard, as I think your FOI demonstrated, to tackle 
areas where there are um, partner um, concerns with local authorities. We're creating the mechanisms to strengthen meaningful partnership working between local authorities and ELC providers and to promote good practice. I work very closely with my colleague, Councillor Stephen McCabe, my counterpart in COSLA on this. As part of the Funding Follows the Child approach, local authorities and early learning childcare providers will be working together meaningfully and in genuine partnership delivering the fund funded entitlement. And the ELC Partnership Forum, which met for the first time this week, will drive action, enable the sharing of good practice partnership working, and will enable authorities and providers to work constructively together to identify solutions to challenges. Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. Can the government say out how it's ensuring that where there are good examples of partnership working across Scotland between local authorities, early learning and childcare providers, that the lessons there can be applied to areas where such partnership working needs to be improved? Minister. So, as I said, we've established this partnership forum where we bring together partners from all over the country. And not only do we identify the challenging areas where partnerships uh, relationships are not great, we do look at the areas where partnerships are really strong. For example, Murray and Angus. Question number seven, Dean Lockhart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it will publish its new economic action plan and whether it will include specific targets for improving the economy. Cabinet Secretary, Derek Mackay. I published the Economic Action Plan yesterday and our targets are very well known. Dean Lockhart. Well, as the Cabinet Secretary will be aware, his government has failed to meet every single one of its own economic targets over the past 11 years, including all seven national performance targets on the economy. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm this is the real reason why the new Economic Action Plan fails to include any future national performance targets? Cabinet Secretary. <laughs> The, 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 the economic action plan that's been very warmly welcomed by Scottish businesses is about getting on with the job. It sets out a range of actions that support our economy and support Scottish business. It sets out a whole host of, of areas in stimulus on innovation and infrastructure and investment. It follows on from the enterprise and skills review. We know the targets that we want to deliver, but I'll give just a few economic indicators for Mr Lockhart. GDP is outperforming the United Kingdom. Unemployment, in terms of record, near record low unemployment, outperforming the United Kingdom. And foreign direct investment, second only to London and the south east of England. That's why businesses and representative organisations like the FSB have welcomed this economic uh, action plan. They have said there's much to be applauded, applauded in this manifesto for Scotland's economy. I'll get on with this action plan whilst the Tories give us distractions and disaster. Question number eight, Peter Chapman. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what percentage of fish landed in Scotland in 2017 was landed in the North East? Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewing. Presiding Officer, the latest national statistics show that in 2017, 56% of the weight and 46% of the value of all fish landed into Scotland was landed into the North East, covering the three port districts of Fraserburgh, Peterhead and Aberdeen. Peter Chapman. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer uh, and for acknowledging the importance of the North East to the fishing industry of Scotland. With this in mind, can the Cabinet Secretary tell me why Aberdeenshire, the site of the biggest uh, f fishing uh, port and in, in Peterhead and the, second, the third biggest port in Fraserburgh, had 100 of 146 applications for EMFF funding uh, rejected and only received 13.7% of the available EMFF funding? Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, I can assure the member that the uh, ports in the North East have benefited from considerably and are due to benefit further from EMF funding. Uh, uh, and I'm happy to share the information with Mr. Chapman since he seems to be unaware of it. But <laughs> yeah. what I might also point out ever so gently to Mr. Chapman and his colleagues is this that this European Maritime Fisheries Fund is part of the EU funding. Ah, yes, exactly. uh, and despite having Shameless, asked his colleague, Mr. Gove and Mr. Eustace, with whom I have a good workmanlike relationship, 
on numerous occasions, face to face, eyeball to eyeball, will you replace this fund post-Brexit? Answer has come absolutely none. Exactly. Absolutely none. Exactly. Which leads me to conclude, presiding officer, that uh, without wishing to be unkind, the handling by Brexit of the UK government can best be described by a Gallic word, a buruch. Exactly.